What's going on, everybody? It is Friday night, technically Saturday morning, but tonight we're going to watch Midnight. Midnight at Midnight, John Russo's, really John Russo's, uh, I mean, of all the movies that I've seen that John Russo has made, I kind of feel like Midnight might be his masterpiece, which is why I decided to come on here and do this tonight. I don't know why I chose to do it at midnight because I'm already like a couple of Iron Cities in. And um, <laughs> so I'm trying to get in the best possible uh, frame of mind to uh, to take this movie in again. But yeah, like I said, I think it was on the last stream. The, uh, the I, I recently just watched John Russo's Midnight for the first time a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and I'm kind of torn. I don't know. I don't. I, like, it's not the greatest movie in the world, but for some reason when it was over, I felt, uh, I, I, I was just, I kind of dug it. I don't know what it was about it. It was just, it's just a really weird movie. Um, it's, uh, it, it's cool seeing John Amplis. Uh, this is in 1982. So this is right around the time of Knight Rider's creep show. Uh, although I think it was filmed in 81. It's cool to see John Amplis. It's cool to see Lawrence Tierney, uh, which uh, me personally, I think a lot of people probably uh, remember from uh, like Reservoir Dogs and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so it's just an interesting it's an interesting movie. I don't I still don't know if it's good, bad or just is what it is. Um, so we're going to watch that tonight. And I figured, you know, what, what, what better way to watch Midnight than at midnight? Um, so we're doing it here late night. Alfa Romero after hours, I guess was what we're going to call this, uh, call this episode. Um, so we'll go ahead and hop into the movie. If you would like to watch along, there is a link down in the description. Um, uh, it is available on YouTube. I think there's a couple of different versions on YouTube, but the link that I'm watching is down in the description below. If you want to watch along and, uh, and go through this with me. Um, so I'll give you a couple seconds if you want to queue it up. But we'll go ahead and get into that. Uh, there's a couple of news uh, tidbits um, I wanted to touch on here before we get into it. Um, I, I'm not going to spend very much time because I I, I, I don't know if I want to be here all, all night. Um, but uh, I just recently saw that on Tubi. It's a Tubi original. There is a, um, I guess what they're calling. I, I haven't seen it yet. I watched like half of the trailer and I said, no, I'm good. Uh, but I will watch it. I'll probably, it's probably one of those things that I'll do like an actual review video here. Um, but it's the Sasuke sisters. Apparently they've done a direct sequel, quote unquote, a direct sequel to Night of the Living Dead called Festival of the Living Dead. Uh, it's available on Tubi right now. Uh, I think it, uh, was it today that it was first released? It was either yesterday or today. Uh, when it was released. Um, so yeah, I'll be watching that at some point because I'm, you know, <laughs> I feel like it's my duty, you know, anything. And, you know, I mean, there's been so many, you know, offshoots of night of the living dead over the years, you know, and, and, you know, night of the living dead, 3d children of the living dead. Uh, I think even, you know, the original, uh, you know, John Russo's original concept for return of the living dead was supposed to be kind of a direct sequel to night of the living dead. Um, I'd be lying if I said I'm interested in what this is going to be because man, that trailer, the trailer looks terrible. Um, but I try to see, that's why I try usually when I go see a movie or, or, you know, there's a movie that I want to see, I kind of avoid trailers. Although I did see that the Maxine trailer has been teased. Um, you know, the Ty West, um, Mia Goth trilogy, I guess is what we'll call it. The Mia Goth trilogy. Uh, the Maxine trailer is supposed to drop on Monday. So I'm kind of excited to check that out because that's kind of one of those things that's been, you know, uh, you know, kind of up in the air for a little while uh, when we're going to see anything from that. And I'm really excited because I was a big fan of X and Pearl. So I'm excited to see what he has in store with Maxine. Uh, but yeah, usually I try to avoid trailers because trailers are, I don't know, they, they trailers in general just kind of turn me off to most movies. Now, like if I go to the movies and I see like all the trailers at the before the movie comes on, it's it's I just roll my eyes. I'm just like, they're all the same. It's the same shit. There's a, you know, uh, you know, they take an old song and they slow it down and put like echo on it and make it eerie or what. It's just like it's the same shit every time, you know, um, 
So I try to avoid trailers as much as possible. So I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, we'll see how it uh, how it goes. I've not heard good things um, so far <laughs> from people that have seen it. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll be checking that out. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but we do have a winner. Um, the final uh, bracket challenge matchup is uh, I'm calling it. It's over. Dawn of the Dead has come out on top. Uh, it is officially George A. Romero's best film, uh, according to you guys, the uh, viewers and subscribers of this channel. A uh, lot of votes. I've loved seeing all the comments and people's takes on, you know, which one's better, you know, and, and just people's people's comments in general on these movies. I've really enjoyed uh, this whole thing. Um, but we do have a winner, and it is uh, Mr. Brett Aitken, uh, Mr. 1911 Guitar Dude himself. Um, so I will be shipping this to you, sir. I still have, I, cause I remember that auction that I did. Now, I still have, if, if you're watching, I still have your address. So I, I will be getting that in the mail to you as soon as I can. And, uh, congratulations. You get, I mean, you got, that's like, like I said, guys, this, this creep show steel book is kind of becoming somewhat of, uh, you know, <laughs> somewhat legendary and you know for the physical media collectors um so even if you're not a big physical media guy if you if if uh, you know if you want to you know sell this sucker on ebay i've seen them going for 60 70 bucks uh already and uh you know they're kind of getting hard to find at walmart um so congratulations man you did it uh, i think you're actually the first person to submit a bracket so you, your uh, your tenacity has paid off. Uh, I really uh, really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody that entered the contest. It was really fun. It re made March go by really fast for me because it was like every day there was like a new you know uh, poll up on the channel. I'd always go back and look and be like, oh, is you know how <laughs> is anything competing with Don? And it was like, no. Uh, I think the final vote. Oh, there was over three hundred votes on the Don versus Day poll, and I think Don won. 70 what was it 79 21 79 percent 21 percent so it wasn't even nearly as close as i was thinking i mean i think you know over 300 votes is a pretty good pretty good size um you know uh what do they call it um a good sample i guess is what you'd call it but uh but yeah brett aiken 1911 guitar dude congratulations sir i will be getting that in the mail to you uh, as soon as possible um check comments here real quick uh al neary's in the house what's up man good evening good evening alpha romero nice to join a little live stream chat i so seldom get to i like the channel very much i appreciate that man um yeah kind of a different uh <laughs> a different time slot tonight uh going a little so i didn't know how many people are going to be in here tonight i was just like you know it's going to be a busy weekend uh it's wrestlemania weekend so i'm going to be you know busy watching that i'm supposed to be um Hopping on over to the uh, the Dead Pit channel, they're doing uh, some WrestleMania reactions after the shows on tomorrow night and and Sunday night. So I'm supposed to be supposed to be hopping on there. Uh, I'm not sure which night, but some point this weekend, I'll be over there talking about it. Um, so I thought I'd hop on here tonight. I was like, you know, midnight at midnight, I, I couldn't pass it up. It's too perfect. Uh, I always thought uh, Midnight was unfairly overlooked, except by British censors in the video nasty area <laughs> era, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I don't I, like I said, I don't know how I feel about this movie. I'm, I'm, I'm. This is my second viewing. Uh, I'm going to um, really give my thoughts, really break it down, and, and try to figure out, like, uh, you know, what is it that I, I enjoy? I, I, I kind of enjoy anything that that you know the Romero connected Pittsburgh, even the worst of the worst, like maybe outside of like children of the living but even children of the living dead you know you get the first 10 minutes with savini kicking ass and that's you know like i remember when i rented that when i was younger when i saw it come out i was like oh and that first 10 minutes and savini's just kicking ass left and right and i'm just like this movie's fucking awesome and then um you know spoiler alert they kill off savini within the first 10 minutes and the rest of the movie is a fucking shit show but uh uh al neary says no film featuring john amplis and lawrence tyranny can be all bad as far as i'm concerned i agree i agree um it also stars a uh oh what what's the fucking guy's name i got his imdb pulled up here the the main cop he's in uh night riders i can't his name's escaping me uh greg besnack uh he's the big 
bald guy with the mustache. He's also in Night Riders. He's one of the the bikers that kind of hijacks everything at the end of the show. Don't forget your basics. Um, there he is, nineteen eleven guitar dude. What's up, man? Thanks for sending the creep show. Still big, looks awesome. If you need my address again, let me know. We'll do. I like I said, I still think I have it um, from the last time I mailed you something. Um, so, uh, but it, if I don't, for whatever reason, I'll definitely get in contact with you, man. But yeah, congratulations. I mean, like I said, I don't even own this, so it, it's pretty pretty freaking cool. And I do love the art. And I've heard people go back and forth about the artwork. Some people love it. Some people are just like, eh, I don't know. Um, but I personally, I, I think it looks. I think it's gorgeous. I think it's it's a hell of a collection. And I mean, two disc, you got, you know, your, your 4K, your Blu-ray, all your special features and your extras, commentaries. I mean, it's it's it, it's a hell of a collection here. Scream Factory did. That's one thing I will say about Scream Factory, especially with, you know, I mean, they've released this creep show, you know, what, three times now. But man, it's loaded with features. And, and like I said, the the transfer on this, one of the best best looking transfers I've seen um, for a Romero film, especially. Um, it looks looks great. It looks as good as you would hope it would be, you know, with it being creep show and all the colors and all the wackiness. So, uh, but good to see you in here, man. I, I appreciate you uh, appreciate you playing and submit that bracket. And it, like I said, it came down to uh, it's funny how that the bracket worked because the the point system and all that. So basically, the guys that you were competing with, uh, Brian Marin and Matthew Soros. Um, they had Day of the Dead as their final winner, and the fact that Day of the Dead they they ended up like near near the bottom of the <laughs> the total ball. So it's 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 pretty interesting to watch. But uh, good to see you in here, man. So yeah, like I said, I'm about to uh, about to start the movie. We're gonna get this started, so we're not going until you know um, daylight tomorrow. Uh, if you guys have questions or anything you guys want to talk about outside of the movie, uh, just shoot them in the comments here. Um, like I said, I don't know how many people we're going to have in here tonight or how active the comments are going to be, but uh, feel free to uh, to take over and, and have a good time staying up staying up late with uh, with me tonight watching John Russo's 1982. To me, I mean, from, from what I've seen, it's John Russo's masterpiece. It's 1982's Midnight. Like I said, the link is down in the description below if you want to hop on and watch along. Um, I'll give you a couple, I'll give you a couple more minutes to do that here real quick. And, um, let me check, make sure volume settings and everything are good here. Yeah. We're getting ready for the big eclipse coming up here. Apparently there's going to be like an influx of like a hundred thousand people into the Evansville area. So I'm not really not looking forward to that over the weekend. So it's going to be a shit show, but yeah, um, like I said, this weekend I'll be over on the Dead Pit channel at some point talking about WrestleMania. So if you guys want to hear me, you know, if you guys are wrestling fans, you want to hear me talk about wrestling, um, that'll be the place to do it. Um, but okay, let's go ahead and get this started. It's uh, midnight, 1982. I'm right here. It's a black, black screen. We're going to go ahead and get it started. I'll do a countdown from three and uh, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get into it. We'll start watching and uh, just shooting the shit here. Like I said, I'm having a couple of Iron Cities tonight, so I'm in the right mindset to to give this a watch so here we go 1982's midnight from john russo and three two one press play now all right all right so we're rolling nice shot of the uh rural landscape outside of it i'm not exactly sure where all this was filmed um like i said i'm fairly new to this movie so i'm I don't know how much I'll be able to, you know, comment with any fun trivia, but, uh, but it definitely, you know, definitely looks like rural Pittsburgh in the, uh, like the winter time. Now I do remember really liking this, this opening scene here. It's pretty fucking disturbing. Again, and you know, the acting wise <laughs> is what it is. But the idea of this mother, like, kind of leading her children, they've caught this young girl in a bear trap, and it's kind of interesting after watching it for the first time, you know, a couple weeks ago, and actually knowing who all these characters are now. It's kind of, it's, it is kind of funny to see them as kids here because, you know, they're, children um 
But of course, as the movie goes on, you know, they they're they'll grow up. But you can kind of see the mannerisms or costume design, I guess, mostly of who these. Yeah, see, so that's like the big fat guy who's like carrying the body. Like that scene's hilarious. I can't wait for that scene where he's like coming down the hill with the body and the sheet. And he just like quickly just like turns around and runs the other way. It's just a weird, awkward, awkward scene. Now, I've never read um, the book because this uh, this was originally a, a novel written by John. I've never read that. Um, I'm kind of interested in, in reading some of Russo's writings um, because, I, I, you know, he's done a lot. I mean, he, he's always he it seems like he's always writing something. There's always something he's coming out with. Um, but Midnight is one that that I would kind of like check out that in the Return of the Living Dead is original novel for Return of the Living Dead. because I'm kind of curious of what he had because apparently the movie that eventually got made, you know, with Dan O'Bannon and. Um, Apparently that was just a completely different take on, on the material. Um, so his original novel, his original idea for return of the living dead was more of a, like I said, a, uh, direct sequel to night of the living dead, as opposed to what, uh, what return of the living dead would become. Something about, you know, evil children that's always, uh, always effective. Especially when they're, um, you know, kind of in a, in a cult setting with, uh, with their mother as the leader. I do like this bit of music here over the credits. I will say that. Credit sequence looks pretty cool. I think, I think the credit sequence works. I mean, <laughs> if nothing else, the credits look cool. <laughs> I guess we got to give John that. But yeah, John Amplis starring based on the novel Midnight by John Russo, edited by Paul McCullough, constant contributor and collaborator with uh with Russo over the years. Casting by Ray Lane. Of course everybody remembers Ray Lane from There's Always Been Ella, Season of the Witch. Um and he worked with Russo um yeah, he, he I think he had a small role. You wouldn't even be able to recognize him um in the booby hatch. But Ray Lane does have a small role in the booby hatch. She's got like long hair and a beard. It's kind of hard to tell if you if you're not looking for him, you're not familiar with special makeup effects by Tom Savini. And this is an interesting bit of trivia that I read on IMDB. I don't know if it's true or not. But apparently Savini turned down doing Friday. Two Friday the Thirteenth Part Two uh, to do this. So I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, take take that uh, take that for what it is, I guess. But yeah, Ray Lane worked with uh, with Russo and, and and the and the boys, the booby hatch. I know he worked on this. I'm not sure if he worked on anything after this. Um, but that's a guy I've always been really interested in his career and would have liked to have seen more of, of Ray Lane as an as an actor in film. Um, looks like Paul McCullough, John Rice, assistant cinematographer, Dawn of the Dead fans out there will recognize John Rice. He's the uh, uh, police officer, the, the SWAT team guy in the the building raid scene where they're raiding the, the tenement. Um, He's the the younger blonde cop who, you know, has the shotgun, ends up shooting himself. That's John Rice. <clears throat> and he actually has a really awesome collection of behind the scenes photos that I did. You know, it's probably been going close to a year, you know, a year ago that I did the stream. But he actually, there's a collection of John Rice behind the scenes photos from Dawn of the Dead that are, you know, pretty, pretty amazing. So if you haven't checked those out, um, you can go find that that stream and give it a watch because those photos are pretty damn cool. And John Rice is one of those guys that, like, I see him. He does he does conventions. Like, I see he's usually at uh, so over in the UK. There, there's kind of like a UK version of Living Dead Weekend called Weekend of the Dead, and it seems like he, I've seen him at that show a couple of times. 
I, but I've never seen him at a, like a Living Dead weekend, and that's like a name that I would love to meet is, is and talk to is John Rice because not only was did he have that role in Dawn, but you know he worked on you know Midnight, worked with Russo, and um, and of course you know worked behind the scenes on Dawn. He was pretty much there for a lot of the shoot uh, on Dawn of the Dead. So that'd be an awesome guest that I would have loved to have met. Um, so I don't know if they'll, they'll ever get him for a living dead weekend or something. I'm not sure why he's never done one. I don't know if there's a, like an issue or something. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, but like I said, I know he does the, uh, weekend of the dead over in the UK. So I don't know if maybe he just lives over in England. Maybe that's where he lives now. I, I really don't know. There's the, uh, I'm just going on and on about John Rice here. I'm not even watching the movie. There's uh, Lawrence Tierney as a uh, drunk, abu uh, sexually abusive stepfather cop. I think he's a stepfather in this. It's a very weird scene. <laughs> But the interest, the weird thing about this, you know, we'll, we'll get there as the movie goes on. But like I said, I just watched this two weeks ago. But the weird thing that was hard for me to reconcile, you know, with watching this is that he kind of becomes the hero in the end. This horribly sleazy, which would never happen in a, in a movie today. Like if you have a character like this, he he has to be, you know, decapitated or blown up or something for anybody, you know. But for him to be kind of like kind of the hero in the end is, you know. It's a little out there. But it's funny when I hear his voice, all I can think of is, you know, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Blue, you know, <laughs> I just think of him from Reservoir Dogs more than anything. But he's been in like a ton of things. Let's look at Lawrence Tyranny's uh B. And this weird music in the <laughs> playing as this is going on. So let's see, he was in Armageddon, 98. His last movie was 2003. When did he... Uh... Well, he died in 2002, so... I guess that was filmed before he passed. He was 82 years old when he, when he died in 19... Uh, or 2002. Uh, I guess he had a voice role in The Simpsons. I'm trying to think of anything else I've seen. I guess he had some TV roles, Silk Stockings, I remember that. Reservoir Dogs, of course. Seinfeld. He was in an episode of Seinfeld. House 3, the horror show. Uh, Naked Gun, and the Files of Police Squad. Oh, yeah, he's the manager of the, the baseball team. I didn't even realize that. I've seen that movie a thousand times. Uh, looks like he was in an episode of Tales from the Dark Side. Silver Bullet, he was in that. The Stephen King. Gloria. He was in Gloria, The Prowler. So, yeah, I mean, just a ton, ton of movies here over the years. And just movies, TV shows. Let's see, 102 credits. So, pretty impressive. For Lord's Tierney. Uh, Al Neary says, Someday I'd like to see a straightforward adaptation of Return. The novel has its points of interest. Um... Yeah, like I said, I've never read the novel, so I'd be really curious to see where, where Russo was originally wanting to go with that. Uh, Al says, if I recall correctly, Midnight takes place on and around Easter. That is the looming cult sacrifice of the heroine, seasonally appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I talked about that last week. I was kind of like, because I did the stream on Saturday, and Easter was the, the next day. And I was talking about Midnight and seeing it for the first time. I was like, you know, maybe I want to do a watch along of Midnight and give that another shot. 
And, uh, you know, as I was doing the stream, I was like, fuck, tomorrow's Easter. And I remember there's a, in the movie, they talk about, they want to do the sacrifice. And he was like, fuck, that would have been a great, a great Easter stream is watching John Russo's midnight on Easter, but we're close. Like you said, seasonally appropriate. I'll, I'll take that. Um, but yeah, I should, I totally should have done, done this on Easter as a, uh, Easter special, the John Russo midnight Easter special. So she's running away from home, and these two guys pull up in a van. I guess their ideas are going to pick her up and uh, and try to have sex with her, I guess. I guess that's what they're insinuating here. So hearing, I've, I've listened to some interviews in preparation for this, and just out of pure curiosity at midnight, um, listened to some interviews with, with John Russo about it, talking about, uh, apparently he lost a lot of footage. Um, I don't know, he was explaining there was like, you know, light flickers or something on some of the, some of the film or, or something. I don't, I don't, can't remember specifically what it was, but apparently, you know, he lost a lot of the footage and I lost, he said he lost a lot of the best takes. So he was kind of piecing it together with, you know, second and third best takes. Um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's John Russo. So you don't know if he's just, you know, saying that to, to kind of, you know, not make excuses, but you know, I, I always get that vibe from, from John Russo when I'm, when I watch like an interview or something with him, I feel like he's, Oh, there's, you know, well, this, this sucked because this, this, and this, and it wasn't my fault. And it was out of my control. And he, he really hates children of the living dead. His name's on it, but he, he wants nothing to do with that movie. I don't know why I keep talking about children of the living dead. And I guess with the festival of the dead thing, that's on Tubi, my mind Im immediately went to fucking children of the living dead. And now I got I guess in my mind, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm going to compare to the two to see which one's, <laughs> which one's better. But I've never, I haven't seen it yet. So it, it may be good. I don't know, but I'm, I highly doubt it. I don't know. This music is something else. I don't know what this is. It kind of fits the scene, but they kind of play this song throughout the movie. And, and that's one thing about Russo's films, too, that I've always been. It's always kind of funny to me. Some of the weird, like, you know, music choices. Like in Santa Claus, I remember at the beginning of um, at the beginning of Santa Claus in the credit sequence when, you know, uh, Debbie Rashawn's walking around the city. It's like that song. It's like, I won't be home for Christmas. Or I'll be sad for Christmas or something. I'm just like, what is this? But I guess this piece of music kind of works for this scene because they're, you know, on the road. She's running away. Oh, I missed that. That shot of her hitting... Uh, hitting the Lawrence Tierney's character in the head with the phone or the radio, I think it was. But yeah, some interesting music choices in, in John Russo's <laughs> filmography. I love his voice. I love Lawrence Tierney's voice. <laughs> it's like his casting in Reservoir Dog is just perfect, I think. I do think this scene, this dialogue here between uh, the mother and the father. I do think this works really well. The performance, I mean, yeah, it's Lawrence Tierney, but I think uh, I think the lady here, I'm not sure who, what her name is. Um, I think they work well together, and I think you can really see 
Tierney does a really good job of where you can kind of see like he, he, this is how he gets away with his, you know, abusive behaviors, his, you know, I guess what the kids call gaslighting now or whatever. He's kind of saying, oh, she probably ran away from home because she's, you know, hanging out with the bad element or she's got issues and kind of deflecting all of it away from him, which, you know, he's the reason that she's run away from home. And he's a police officer, so that, you know. And you believe it, because this kind of shit, you know, really happens in real life. This is kind of how these things, you know, happen. I've, I've known, I've known some girls that have been in similar situations. It's one of those things you'd never, never imagine, but. I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's kind of a weird subject, but. But I do think this scene does a good job of kind of. Uh, kind of displaying that. Again, it's really weird that they kind of make, you know. <laughs> kind of make this character the the hero at the end, but what can you do? What the hell? I do think this dialogue works. It is, uh, you know, it's a little. Oh, now we're back to the. <laughs> You're on your own. You're all alone. Going home. <laughs> so weird. What is it about? I was thinking about this the other day, and it really pertains to this movie, because like I said, I watched it. I, I as you know, I've. I've Film lover, uh, you know, a person who likes good movies. There's something th about horror films that, like, fan, like horror fans, like myself and, and you guys. There's something about horror films that that people that you know that love good films love horror films too. They're very forgiving of horror films, and Midnight is a perfect example. It's like, like I know that this is. To a normal person, they'd watch this and think like, wow, this is made for five bucks and, you know, stapled together and held together with Band-Aids and bubble gum. But, but there's something to it. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's just weird. I don't know. There's a vibe to it. It's hard to explain. But yeah, there's just something about horror fans that they're very forgiving of things that like you normally wouldn't be too forgiving of, like a bad comedy or a bad action movie even well, i guess action movies too i mean a bad action movie can still be pretty pretty fucking entertaining but you know it's like a, just a bad movie when you see a bad movie you know it's like oh this is a bad movie i never want to watch this again but when it comes to horror a horror movie can be a bad movie but you can you still love it for some reason i don't know it's like hell of the living dead perfect example that movie is absolutely fucking terrible but on some level, I love that movie. I've seen that movie so many times. I could, I love watching Hell of the Living Dead. A lot of those, like, you know, shitty Italian zombie movies from back in the day, you know. But yeah, I, I don't know. I've always wondered, what is it about horror films that, that you know, horror fans are, are so forgiving of when it comes to, like, every aspect that, that we would normally judge a movie on? I just think it's interesting. Uh, I'll say uh, I'm a fan of 40s film noir where Lawrence Tierney is uh, ubiquitous along with his in real life brother, actor Scott Brady. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, I love he had such a long career. Uh, yeah, he, he really did. I mean. So we're getting introduced to the pastor here. 
but yeah, Lawrence Tiernan, I mean, like I said, 102 credits, acting credits to his name. And like even stuff before this, what are we, you know, what was his first movie? When did he do his first movie? 43. 1943. Gilder Sleeve on Broadway. Uncredited as the uh, cab driver. A lot of uncredited stuff, but I guess his first credited role would be 1944. Youth, Run, Youth Runs Wild. Uh, by Larry Duncan. Never seen any of those. Uh, that's one era of film. When you talk about 40s film noir, and, and that's one era of film that I feel like I need to watch more of. I've always been, I don't know why, I've always been really stubborn when it comes to, honestly, anything pre-Night of the Living Dead. I don't know why. Uh, Psycho, obviously, I mean, that that's an obvious movie that you gotta watch. But a lot of, like, like the universal horror movies and stuff, like, I'm, I'm really starting to try to catch up on those. Me and my, my three-year-old daughter, I, we sat down and watched... Uh, Bride of Frankenstein for the first time together, um, you know, a few weeks ago, and she she loved it. I don't, know, I was kind of surprised. I was like, man, this movie. Uh, I was kind of just testing her to see like how long is she gonna last? Because I mean, it's a fucking you know ninety year old movie at this point, in black and white, and it's like, how's a three year old gonna take this? But she was, she was drawn in. I mean, it was it was pretty insane she loves halloween and monsters and stuff like that so i feel like it was a good way a good introduction I'm not trying to you know scar her for life or anything and being like hey let's you know hey three-year-old daughter let's watch uh henry portrait of a serial killer or something like that you know let's watch maniac uh, but uh but yeah i'm trying to go back and, and really watch a lot of those older movies um I just, I just feel like I need to. Like, I've never even seen Citizen Kane, believe it or not. I don't know why. It's just, I don't know. I've always had a a block, a mental block to that era of film for whatever reason. But anything like, you know, late 60s, 70s, 80s. Like, that's that's the era of film that I watch most. That I prefer to watch most. I just feel like there's just something special about that time period. So I think we're about to get our first. So this guy is kind of playing out kind of like a slasher, like your your normal typical slasher, which is kind of what we when this movie came out, it was kind of billed as, you know, because this was 1982. I mean, they were right in the middle of the uh you know, the slasher craze. So Midnight was kind of marketed as being, you know, your your prototypical slasher. I think it's a little different. I feel like it's more in the vein of like a, like a, you know, not, I, I'm, I'm not going to compare it to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but kind of in the vein of like a knockoff of Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something, you know. It's like, okay. like this piece of music here and of course I, I didn't i don't think i mentioned it or maybe i did um uh, paul mccullough did the music on this and he was also the uh cinematographer as well and of course if you know if you guys are un unaware of who paul mccullough is he was the one that wrote the original screenplay for the crazies uh when it was originally tall uh titled the mad people and you know, romero took it and renamed it to crazies kind of did it his own way <clears throat> which i was always curious i don't know if that drove a wedge in between george and paul and paul kind of went with you know because when 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 george and and, and john russo kind of split ways i feel like i remember hearing some stories about there being a, a little bit of bad blood between them because you know it happens i mean even in any form of business even if you're good friends sometimes it'll you know split you apart but uh so they all kind of they went their separate ways and and you know one you know george took one set of you know crew members and russo took another set of crew members and so paul mccullough really went on to work with with russo throughout the years as opposed to george and i don't know if there was any kind of like you know bad blood or anything there between george and paul mccullough just because uh you know, George kind of rewrote his script 
for the crazies when you know changed it from what it, I guess originally was or meant to be. I don't know. That's uh, although I do remember seeing. I think it was. I think it was Lawrence De Vincent who posted. Um, I think this guy's about. I think he's about to get it. Oh yeah, he, <laughs> here he comes. Ah. It's my stabbing sound effects there. But yeah, I think it was Lawrence DeMenza posted a, um, it was an article in a magazine from early to mid-70s. I don't remember what the magazine was called, but it was an interview with Paul McCullough on the, you know, Night of the Living Dead and making, you know, the, you know, working with Leighton Image and all, you know, working in Pittsburgh throughout those years. And uh, I remember, I haven't read the article, but I remember, I think Larry commented on it. It was interesting hearing Paul talk about George and, and he was kind of, not shitting on George, but just kind of, you could kind of tell that there was some animosity there between the two. So I don't know, but I, I do, I would love to track that, uh, that article down and, and read it all the way through because I, I'd be very interested in, in finding out, um, in finding out what happened there. So yeah, the, the, I guess the, the kids have rolled into hillbilly town. Of course, you know, one of the guys being black, that's uh, <laughs> that's a big no-no here, I guess. Which, believe it or not, I mean, when you think of, you know, Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania, you think of, like, Northeast, you're like, oh, you know, it's like liberal Northeast, you know, you think of East Coast, but but Pennsylvania, it's interesting. And, and you can see it even, like, when you go to Pittsburgh, you can actually feel like there's parts of it's that's why Pittsburgh's so I love Pittsburgh so much. It's it's everything. It's like you'll be in one spot and you'll feel like you're it's a lot of like Catholic and Italians and you know, all this do you see all this stuff? And you go a little farther outside of Pittsburgh and you're in the middle of fucking Alabama. Like it's I've heard people say that Pittsburgh is basically, you know, Pittsburgh on one end, Philadelphia on the other end, and then the middle is, you know, Alabama. <laughs> so it's like these this, this place probably does exist somewhere. Those rednecks probably join the whole thing. I guess Harrisburg is probably where a lot of them are. Uh, Grande's Graveyard is up. What's up, man? Late night tonight. Alpha Romero Alpha after hours. <laughs> Alpha hours, I guess we'll call it. But uh, yeah, everybody, Grande went and... Uh, Got to got to watch Day of the Dead on the big screen tonight. We were talking about that earlier. Very very. That's one of the, that's one of the Romero films I have not seen on the big screen yet. And that's one that I would love to see on the big screen at some point. Um, Midnight is a brutal film. <laughs> yeah, man. Like I was saying, like I don't. That's why I'm watching it again tonight. I watched it for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and I I left it like. As I was watching, I was like, man, this is really bad. This is, you know, it's, it feels very Ed Woodish. I don't, I don't know. But after it was over, I was just kind of like, you know, I, I kind of dug that. I don't know. I don't know why. There was something about it. I was just like, I kind of dig it. I mean, to me, it's like, I, it, from what I've seen of John Russo's films, I mean, to me, it's his best film. So I, I <laughs> it's not saying much, but for what it is, and I think uh, I think the budget on on midnight was like seventy. Uh, I want to say Russo said seventy one thousand dollars, which in nineteen eighty two was, you know, insane, insanely low budget. Um, so you know, seventy one thousand bucks. It's not so bad. Come on, man, it's not so bad. Uh, random question since you mentioned the crazies and Paul, what do you know about Lee Hessel? I honestly know nothing. I, I don't know too much about Lee Hessel. I know he was basically kind of a distributor. Um, and he worked, you know, with there's always vanilla season of the witch and the crazies. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't really know too much about Lee Hessel. I know that you know, I've heard some stories, you know, where he, he had these like, grandiose ideas of how to promote the crazies. Uh, by having guys in the white suits, you know, walking around Times Square, you know, <laughs> when the movie opened, um, 
that's that's kind of the one thing I've always heard about Lee Hessel is that he was a very creative, like his ideas were much bigger than his capabilities, I guess, like his, his promotional uh, ideas. Um, and of course, he would constantly rename and, and try to like he was the one that he's basically the guy that would, you know, rename the films and try to sell them as something else. Like instead of it being Jack's wife, it's Hungry Wives. He tries to sell that as like a soft core, you know, sex picture or something. It didn't sell. So he changed it to Season of the Witch. Crazy. Same thing. He tried to sell it as, you know, code name Trixie at one point. Um, it's always vanilla, of course. Uh, I think the original title of that was The Affair. So, I mean, he was that kind of guy. He was there's trying to sell this movie any way possible. If we can sell it as a horror film or we can sell it as a softcore porno film or what do we got to do to sell this picture? Um, but yeah, I've always always heard that he had, you know, grandiose ideas and maybe not not quite the <laughs> the capability of pulling them off. But, but yeah, outside of that, I, I don't really know too much about Lee Hessel. I'd like to uh, I, that is a good idea is to kind of dig in and, and see see what I can find about him. I I thought that when I first saw that, I thought this kill here was a little weird didn't make much sense to me first time I watched it. Let me see if it makes any sense to me this time as I watch it. So he, he's got her in the tub here. And I, it's understandable. I mean, he's a big dude. He could hold her down like that. I guess just kind of waterboarding her <laughs> or choking her. It's a pretty brutal way to go in a way, I guess. What are those shoes? What is she, a fucking astronaut? Yeah, I don't know about that one. Uh, Alan Erie says, I consider The Crazies kind of a creative bridge between George Romero's earliest aspirational films and his more sophisticated work like Martin and Dawn of the Dead. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I th to me, The Crazies feels more like a, you know what we would, we would come to know as a Romero film. Um, more so than, you know, it's always vanilla and season of the witch. Cause I do, I love both of those films, but they're very different than, you know, anything that George would do afterwards. Uh, although I, you know, I've heard it said before that season of the witch is somewhat thematically, even somewhat very similar to Martin. Um, in just the terms of like the, the power of the mind. And if you believe something strong enough, you will be like, you know, where Jan White's character believes that this witchcraft is working, you know, and it does, but it's not because of the witchcraft. It's just because, you know, she calls the guy up, you know, and says, hey, come over. Um, he didn't, you know, she didn't put a spell on him and like lure him in. It was just more of like she thought that was going to happen and then it's like, OK, I'll call him. Uh, or, you know, whereas Martin thinks he's a vampire and, you know, he thinks strongly enough and he craves blood you know i don't know but uh yeah totally totally agree on that the craziest to me kind of felt like george was trying to figure out how to how to you know is the first step in trying to figure out how to how to pull off dawn of the dead in my opinion in terms of the editing and the pacing and stuff especially because the crazies and dawn of the dead in terms of the shots and the editing and the pacing of it are very very similar a lot of like steady you know, static shots, a lot of quick cuts, you know, it's very I mean, before music videos. I mean, Romero's style, his editing style was a very, you know, music video MTV style editing. Um, just a lot of, you know, a lot of coverage and a lot of cuts, <laughs> but it worked. I mean, you know, he made it work. <clears throat> so again, we're hearing this, fun little song as they're grocery shopping. <laughs> I noticed this shot. If you, if you look closely in the background, these cars are kind of stopping and, and like slowly driving by, like wondering what the fuck is going on. Cause it does, you know, I'm sure there's like, it's probably John Russo and maybe Paul McCullough stand out there with a camera and a, you know, a boom mic or something while these 
kids are stealing these groceries in the back of a van and these cars are probably just driving by wondering what the fuck is going on. Oh, now we got the car police chase. It's the buzz. Uh, Al here with a little information on Lee Hessel. Lee Hessel was one of uh, many indie distributors based in Times Square, New York City, who specialized in exploiting the loopholes of the new MPAA rating system to deceptively uh, market regular films to softcore porn. Uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's basically, you know, that's basically kind of how he tried to uh, <laughs> tried to promote and sell Georgia stuff. And none of it worked. I don't know. God, the siren sound effect is <laughs> its going to drive me out of my mind. I don't know if I'd believe that the uh, this van here would outrun this police car, but you never know. Oh, the siren effect. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Again, interesting choice of music for this, too. It's not very... Uh... <laughs> I guess you got to do what you, what you got to do here, which is kind of, you know, that's what you got to respect about John Russo. If nothing else, the man did what he had to do to get to get his films made. I mean, the dude made dude made films. And uh, that's something that a lot of people can't say. A lot of people love to do, but a lot of people can't say uh, that, that they ever, you know, got a film made. But Russo, come hell or high water, it's going to make a movie, whether it was a piece of shit or not. Dude made it. Multiple times. This actually, I, I did I had no idea, but apparently there's a sequel to Midnight that came out like 1993, 92, something like that. I don't know where the hell you'd find that, but it is, you know, John Russo written and directed sequel to it's Midnight 2. Oh. <laughs> I love that shot. I don't know why it cracks me up. It's hilarious. They're driving down this road and the fucking fat guy with the, the dead body like runs out in the road and like quickly oh turns and goes the other way in like one shot. There's just something awkward about that. <laughs> it's classic. Uh Grande said, I would love to see you do a show on all Romero distributors or producers. That, that, I'm sure at some point I will. I did that uh I did that uh stream on uh, Richard Rubenstein his connection to, to George but yeah that would be a, that would be an interesting show to talk about especially you know, you go back and you look at you don't want, you want to talk about like uh, Herbert Steinman and, and you know you want to go into like uh, investors even because I think Steinman the Herbert Steinman story is is very interesting because his son would go on to you know Danny Steinman would go on to direct uh, you know Savage Streets and Friday the 13th part 5 and um but yeah that that definitely take that into consideration that's a good idea uh see like talking about uh Sala the Grunwalds um Richard would be cool Grant I know you cover Richard. Yeah, okay. yeah I mean um that would be an interesting get. We were actually at Horror Hound when I was talking to uh, Michael Felsher. He was talking about he was actually going. If he was, I don't remember when he said, but he was actually playing. He was actually planning to uh, to travel to New York City to interview uh, Peter Grunwald um, for an upcoming release. Use your imagination. Because I don't want. I don't want to say anything. Getting him. Getting... <laughs> Somebody be like, "Hey, uh, I'm gonna run into Felsher again," and he's gonna be like, "Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I heard you were fucking spilling." But I think I already told you, Grande, so you know, you know. But but yeah, Peter Romo, that that's an interesting uh, because he worked with George. His first film with George was um, 
monkey shines. And then he, he, he worked George on monkey shines, then didn't work with George again until bruiser in 2000. Um, and then he was just kind of George's guy throughout the rest of his career. Um, I haven't really seen a lot of interviews and stuff with Peter Grunwald. Um, I've seen some, like a lot of the, you know, the features for like survival of the dead and diary of the dead and stuff like that. But yeah, definitely, definitely a good idea. Uh, Al, Al Neary agrees. Good idea. Um, yeah, uh, it's a, But yeah, Lee Hessel is definitely one that I'd like to do a little more research on. Just because he, you know, that time period, you know, after night and before Martin. I'm incredibly fascinated by that time period. So I think we're close to the first appearance of John Amplis, which in a lot of releases, John Amplis is um, credited as kind of the star of the movie, but he really doesn't show up until we're, how far are we into this now? Uh, Timestamp, uh, if you're watching along uh, right now, I'm at uh, 42 minutes, 40 seconds. So about 45 minutes of the movie, we don't even see uh, Amplis or uh, Greg uh, Besnack or... Be a snack. So is this I'm trying to remember? Look. So I think this is John Russo's second feature film as a director. First as a solo director, but I know uh, Booby Hatch, she was co-directors with Rudy, uh, Rudy Ritchie. I'm sorry, but if I'm out in the fucking middle of nowhere in the dark like that and you hear somebody laughing, I'm going to be like, hey, is that you? What the fuck is his uh, director credits? There we go. <clears throat> So John Russo's done 15 movies as a director. Apparently, The Red Tide Massacre, I've never even heard of that. It came out in 2022. Apparently, he's the director of that. Um, so, yeah, Booby Hatch. Yeah, Booby Hatch, 76, Midnight 82. So, yeah, this is his second. Uh, Heartstopper is another one from 89 that I've never seen. Is this um sorry, I'm just looking at his IMDB at this point. It's a four point nine on IMDB. Not a bad score. <laughs> Not a bad score for it. So here we go. Lawrence Tyranny is coming to the rescue. So weird. Uh, Grande says, uh, fun fact, John Amplis hated Midnight. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard him talk about Midnight before. <laughs> I've never, I've never, I don't think, I don't guess I've ever heard him say specifically that he hated uh, the movie. But I think he, he's just kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, I really don't want to talk about that. Kind of like uh, Galen Ross with uh, Madman, where she's like, yeah, you know, I did that, but uh, we don't got to talk about that. But I don't think I don't think Ambulance does a bad job in this. I think it's a weird casting choice. I, I don't see like I could totally see the other members of the family as part of this like, you know, redneck cult clan or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I, Ambulance doesn't. It's a weird casting choice, I guess. Especially for an actor. You know, Amplis is, uh, I mean, you know, this is after Martin. This is after Knight Riders. So Amplis, you know, Dawn of the Dead. I mean, he had, you know, a couple of roles in Dawn of the Dead. 
maybe he just wasn't as available. But I know Amplis was probably because I mean, like we mentioned earlier, Ray Lane was the uh, casting director on this, and I know Amplis and Ray Lane were were really really close friends, and they worked a lot, and then the Pittsburgh theater and then stuff like that back in the day. So I'm sure that's the connection here. Is uh, I'm sure you know Ray put in a call to John and said, "Hey, you want to come be in this uh, this uh, movie, this slasher movie that we're doing?" And I'm sure John was happy to because John, I've heard John just gush over Ray Lane over the years. Anytime you mention Ray Lane's name, I mean John has nothing but the best things to say because you know, unfortunately uh, Ray Lane passed away quite a few years ago. But I would guess that that's probably the connection here. But, but hey, it's a gig. <laughs> uh, you're saying, uh, trying to recall the name of Hessel's company, Canvas Films. Yeah, that was Canvas. And apparently, a lot of like you were talking about with uh, with Lee Hessel and his. I guess style of promotion and you know whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, he before I guess before he was before he picked up. I guess it was there's always been um, before he picked up there. There's always vanilla that he would. Canvas was basically only doing like softcore porno films, and I think I think his I think him working with George. You know, with, with there's always vanilla and season of the witch. I think that was Hessel's attempt at um, at trying to legitimize, you know, campus films a little bit. But but again, he just kind of because they they kind of made some of the promotional materials for there's always vanilla kind of make it look like it's like some kind of softcore porn or something like that. So uh, let's see Hessel's promotional strategy for the crazy strongly resembled Aquarius films handling of Dr. Butcher MD with actors hired to wear bloody costumes in public displays and such great belly who yeah that, that's a cool uh, old school uh, promotion there I've always loved the story I guess I guess it would have been Richard Rubenstein who would have come up with this but the story for I want to say it was cans when they took Martin to cans I think it was um he had a lot of those, you know, little guillotine um, things that Martin uses in the movie with you, know, you know, put your finger in there. He had a lot of those and just started like giving them out to people as kind of like a promotional thing. I would love to find one of those. I don't know if those exist or whatever happened to those. If they had, you know, if they were like the little, you know, magic kit guillotine, they had like the Martin logo on it or something. That would be something if I was on eBay and I came across one of those things, like it'd be hard to pass. That was I've never seen anything. If it if it's even real, I remember, I remember even where I heard that story. It may have been on one of the commentaries that uh, Richard did with George and uh, Tom. But I think I, I do remember hearing him talk about that as like a way that they were trying to promote Martin with the little <laughs> little guillotine. I was like, that that's interesting. I don't know what people would get from that because it's such a you know just a small piece of the movie, but. I don't know. Maybe I guess the idea that you know the magic isn't real. Maybe I, I don't know. But one of my other favorite promotional tactics I remember hearing about is when Cronenberg's The Fly came out, and a lot of theaters were giving out you know uh, like antenna, like a little thing. You got the antenna on it for kids. Because they thought, you know, it's the fly, you know, it's a fun thing, you know, and I guess they were trying to appeal to the kids and the kids went in and, and were probably scarred for life. And many of them are probably, you know, in, in solitary confinement today. So I don't know if that worked out quite as well as the uh, <laughs> I forget what theater chain it was, but it was a specific theater chain. Um, <laughs> they were like the fly, this will be fun. Let, let's uh, let's hand hand out fake antenna to all the kitties as they go in to watch the fly.
Oh, he's making a run for it. I will say this one thing about this movie, too. We were talking about uh, Tom Savini's effects. The effects in this are fairly good for a movie with a $70,000 budget. That's one thing that helps it out a lot, I think. And I think Tom and and, and, and John Russo were remain friends to this day. That's a good gunshot. Although you can see the hole in the head. I don't know about this reaction by this guy, though. He's just like, you killed him. Again, like I said, horror us horror fans were willing to forgive almost anything. Some of this acting is a little, uh, a little eh. Atlas is good, though. I just love, like, his physical movements. That's always been my uh, favorite part of any Amplis performance. I just don't know about the casting choice of trying to make him a backwoods redneck or whatever you want to call it. I guess the first time I watched this, I didn't quite pick up on are, are they real police officers or did they kill a couple of police officers and take their uniforms? Hey. I do like the ex like the execution style uh, killings here that they do. Now we get the chase. That is a tight uniform on uh, <laughs> Greg Besnack here. He looks good. I mean, he's got an interesting look. I guess that's why they put him on the poster and why he's hiding behind me right now. Not literally, but, you know, the background here. Yeah, outside of the goofy, you're on your own. <laughs> outside of that music, the score for this is pretty cool. I like it. Minimalist, but I don't like that in a horror soundtrack. It's funny. I was actually talking to uh, Lawrence Vincent the other day about this movie because I he last week I, I mentioned that I uh, at Horror Hound had come across an original one sheet uh, of, of Midnight. And it was like seventy bucks, and I was almost <laughs> Christ gonna laugh. I was like, I was I was almost trying to talk myself into picking it up <clears throat> but after looking on ebay because after i did the stream live, i did go on ebay to look to see if i could find any and, and just see what they were going for 70 bucks was probably seven times worth what a lot of them are going for so luckily i didn't you know fuck myself on that one but yeah lori uh lori larry was telling me about uh he actually owns the 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 rifle here that uh, that the the Greg uh, Besnack's character is holding, he actually bought it from uh, John Russo. Russo's really good. That's one thing about John Russo. He's Russo's always been really really good about uh, hanging on to props and stuff over the years. I mean, if you follow him on Facebook, he's always got something up for sale from from his. I think the other day I saw he had. Uh, uh, I want to say like screen screen used or screen worn costumes from Children of the Living Dead or something like that up for sale. Well, I thought that was pretty cool. Hmm, that's not a bad scare. <laughs> it kind of got me there as I was watching it. He's really good. I like uh, 
old gray here. So now this is where I think we're coming upon the uh, the house of the family of the cult. I don't know. I I kind of I kind of dig this movie. <laughs> Uh, second watch, you know, watch through. I mean, yeah, it's flawed. It's you know, it's it's kind of a mess in places. The acting is, it is you know, well, kind of what you'd expect. But I don't know why. I, I'm kind of digging it. <clears throat> I feel like this is kind of where the movie picks up. Granted, we are almost an hour into it, so it takes about an hour for the movie to really <laughs> to really kick into gear. But I think once we get to this point, once really once Amplis and uh, and Greg Maznak come on the screen, I, I feel like it kind of goes into a different gear after it. It's just weird. No. Oh. Get some Savini effects here. The <laughs> severed head, not maybe not the best looking head, severed head, but hey, if anybody can make yeah, you know uh, a makeup effect or a special effect look good with very little money, it's 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 Tom. So so I guess you know at this point we're still not sure if these cops are just bad cops or if they're in on it. Or if they're even cops, like I'm, I'm still not sure if they're actually, which would be an interesting, you know, character uh, plot point that it was ripped off from, uh, or not ripped off from, but ripped off by uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake with uh, Arlie Ermey. I always thought it was interesting if you had the police on your side too, but yeah. So at this point, we're kind of realizing that they're a part of it. They're they're in on it. Maybe they're maybe just maybe they're not real police officers. Yeah, she liked to shit him. Damn he punched her in the back of the head. <laughs> it's just weird seeing Amplis in a role like this. I don't know why. Well, wait a minute. Oh, there we go. Lost, lost sound for a second. But yeah, Amplis was actually on uh, the other night on the Garf Network. Um. If you guys aren't haven't subscribed to the Garf Network on YouTube yet, go check it out. I Put a link to it in the uh, community section, but they actually did a, a, a David Emge tribute video or tribute stream the other night. And actually had Amplis uh, on there talking about his friendship with uh, with David Emge because they actually you know worked together at Lady Astor's back in the day, um, you know before Emge got cast in Dawn of the Dead. Which everybody worked at Lady Astor's back in the day. Between Amplis and M. Gee and Christine Romero, which Christine Forrest at the time. Um, who else? Scott Reiniger, I think, worked there. I I love that little. I don't know if I I would almost guess that that was a an improv an improvisation there from John John Amplis as they're talking, just kind of taking the card and and laying it down from where she was playing uh, solitaire or whatever the hell was going on. I 
Again, I know it's probably budgetary, but I kind of feel like the girls in the, the dog kennels here probably should look a little more roughed up than they do. It looks like they just kind of they're just kind of there and they're fine with it. I don't know. But yeah, a little nitpick. But yeah, to me, this feels this just feels more like a, uh, a Texas Chainsaw ish kind of movie, like a you know a, a knockoff chainsaw movie. Um, more so than just your your typical slasher that you that you got around this time, nineteen eighty two. Uh, thanks for the link to the Garf Network Alpha. I didn't know about that. Yeah, man, check it out. They they it's been a little slow lately. Um, you know, past few months, they haven't really done too much on there, but I think they're starting to do, I know, uh, Matt Blasey and Eric Kent, they're doing a, uh, live stream first Wednesday of every month. Um, which they did, you know, recent, the other day they did the David M. Key tribute, which was a great, great tribute show. Um, <clears throat> they had a number of guests and some, some, uh, some different footage and photos and stuff that I'd never seen of David Emke. So it was, pr it was pretty sweet. Um, but before that, they actually had an interview with Sean Roberts. Uh, if you're familiar with land of the dead, diary of the dead, uh, and land of the dead, he's the, uh, the kid at the beginning of the movie that shoots himself after he gets bit. Um, I think he also played like Wesker, Albert Wesker and, and some of the resident evil movies the guys had a hell of a career. Um, you know, in, in the horror realm, um, but they had him on and interview him. It was really interesting hearing his take because it was interesting hearing the take of like a, an aging because he's kind of a, you know, he's a built guy. He's used to playing kind of these, you know, uh, action -y roles, you know, kind of the action hero roles. And now he's, he's getting a little older now, which is, it was just interesting to hear his, uh, his take and his, his thoughts on the current film industry and, and especially as you know up in canada where he's from of course you know working with george and land diary he's a canadian actor um just getting his you know hearing his um uh, his take and his thoughts on the current landscape of you know the canadian films and because if you remember that's why george did those films in canada canada was kind of the place to shoot film back you know the you know early 2000s you know really through the 2000s really because it was cheaper. I mean, just the, you know, it, you could go up there with, I guess it's the, the currency exchange at the time. The, um, so Canada was kind of a hotbed for filmmaking. It's and apparently it's not, not like that at all anymore. It's, it's kind of a shit show up there. So, which, you know, Canada's kind of been a shit show in, in many aspects of <laughs> the last few years, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> And I think I think yearly, not maybe not yearly, but oddly enough, I think that new Festival of the Living Dead movie that the Saska sisters did. I think that's a, a, a Canadian Canadian based uh, film. And honestly, I've never seen anything that the Saska sisters have done. I don't know if anybody in the chat, if anybody still up with me. Uh, any anything that you guys recommend checking out from them because yeah i'm gonna have to watch festival of the, of the living dead <laughs> i don't want to but i mean fuck it i do uh, i'll do it for the channel basically um but uh, i know they've done like american mary i think was a movie that they did i know they did the uh, the remake to cronenberg's rabbit um which i've heard mixed things on i've heard some people say it was really good and some people say not so good uh, but that's one that I've been meaning to to kind of check out at some point, but I've just never have. So I don't know. I, I really don't know their work all that well, to be honest.
So this is definitely very chainsaw esque with you know keeping the mother, you know, <laughs> the mother is basically you know uh, fossilized at this point. We're not fossilized. I don't know the word, the term for it. It's what time are we looking at here? It's past one o'clock. I know that. So. But yeah, just kind of keeping the dead, uh, the dead relative, father, mother, grandpa, you know, from Texas Chainsaw. Which I remember hearing a story, I don't remember where I heard it, but it was John Russo talking about this with, uh, I can't remember, it was an interview or what it was. But he was talking about the first time that he showed this movie to George, that him and George sat down and watched this movie, and George, George's initial, like one thing that stood out with him when they got to the end here, when when the, the mother is revealed and that, that she's, you know, a corpse and, you know, rotting. Um, George was like, who the hell is that? <laughs> and John was like, yeah, it's kind of hard to kind of hard to piece together that that's the mother from the beginning of the movie. Of course, you know, the opening scene where the mother's, you know, with the kids and they, they've got the bear trap on the girl. But George was just like, who the hell is that? <laughs> This was a fairly effective scene, if I remember correctly. Whatever when I watched, I thought, you know, this is pretty effective. It's almost home invasion esque, which is like one of my biggest fears. Like that's why that's one of the scenes. That's that's one of the reasons why I don't. And I mentioned it earlier, but Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. That's one of those movies that I I I I like, and I appreciate. And I understand that it's a very well-made movie. It's very, very effective. But it's it's one of those movies that's like so effective in a way that it's like I don't really like to watch it very often. Um, and specifically the home invasion scene, you know, where they're sitting there watching the video, uh, the camcorder footage of, you know, the, the home invasion where they, you know. Sometimes that shit will just pop into my head and it's just like, ugh. You know, where they're holding the mother down. They they kill the son in front of the mom. And it's just like, hey, it's rough stuff, but very well made. But this is not, you know, not on that level. But I think the scene is, you know, you got a couple here playing Frisbee in the backyard, which some of the worst Frisbee throws I've ever seen. <laughs> it's this guy. I mean, she's whipping him out. I mean, it's she's, you know, perfectly thrown Frisbee. Up. But then he picks it up or catches it and he tries to throw it. And it's like this wobbly fucking thing that goes way off into <laughs> way off into left field somewhere. So I've never seen anybody struggle to throw a Frisbee before like that in my life. So, so that's a funny, uh, funny aspect. Uh, Alton Reese says, I'm very skeptical of the Saska sisters, to be honest. I haven't seen their stuff, but I don't like the vibe of the clips I've seen. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... Like I said, that that trailer for you know, uh, fuck is it called? Festival of the Living Dead. It looks terrible. Um, but like I don't know too much about them. I know that you know talking about the Garf, they 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 did an interview. Which fuck it, it it's late. Who cares? Um, <laughs> there is there's they on the Garf. There's a podcast that's called like Horror X or something like that, and it's these two women and. Uh, I guess they just interview women in horror or something like that. And um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. Like, eh, I'm just not. I, I tried to watch. They did something the other night. I tried to watch. Every time I tune in, it was like they were just standing there like they, they're like, they're, it's like this. But they're doing a stream. It's like they're on one side and the guest is on the other. And every time I tune in, it's like one of the one of those women were always just like making this like. Goofy ass fucking face the whole time. And I'm just like, this is I just feels phony you know I, I don't know but they were on there they had an interview i haven't watched it because like i said I, I i'm not a big fan of of that uh but outside of that i mean that you know i really love what eric and matt do over there i've been a big fan of theirs for for many many years i talk about them all the time on here um because before that they were doing a podcast called wgon radio 
and uh but, but yeah that the the horror x i mean i don't god bless them you know I'm, I'm sure they're they do some other podcasts and it's really just the one woman in, in in particular that's like every time it's just like this phony over the top like oh it's so good it's not for me i i, I just just you know be natural man I didn't mean to go on a tangent about that all of a sudden, but whatever the fuck it. Uh, I saw Henry twice in the theater when it came out and exactly zero times ever since twice was quite enough. Yeah. But I mean, I feel like you would agree that it is, a, you know, a very well-made film, very well acted. I think, you know, Michael Rooker is amazing in that. And Tom towels is amazing in it. It's a great, great film, very effective, very well-made but it's just not a film that I really ever want to go back and read. Like I'm never just like, Oh, I'm in the mood to, you know, watch Henry portrait of a serial killer. I'm just, it's just not, um, I don't even own that, um, on anything. I, I don't own that on VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, 4k, anything. I don't own that. That's one that I would own, but it's like kind of one of those titles. It's kind of hard to find. Uh, I don't see them very often. Um, but it's definitely, you know, Definitely one of those that I would own just because I understand that it's, you know, uh, kind of a seminal horror film um, and very different. You know, again, in the late 80s, it was very different than anything else that was kind of coming out at that time horror wise. Uh, fuck. I'm losing sound or something over here. It's getting. Agree. I just have to respect my own limits. Yeah. Yeah. Some things I don't get, man. Some of the, like some of the more hardcore, like snuff, like almost like, you know, fake snuff, like I like effects, um, you know, Dusty Nelson's effects. Um, like that's a movie about, like there's a snuff film in the movie and it's kind of about, you know, stuff, but it's a well-made movie. And I, I love that movie. It's a great movie, but some of the like stuff, like I know they were talking about, I think it was Rambo or, I think it was Rambo Raff talking about it on the stream the other night, talking about the the Fred Vogel, uh, August Underground stuff, like that type of stuff. I don't get it. Like I'm just like, there's got there's a certain type of person that's into that type of stuff, and I'm just I'm just I, that ain't me. I'm not in. <laughs> that's not my that's not my thing. But you know, as Cornette says, some people like to have their uh, their balls nailed to step stools. I don't know. <laughs> What's the other thing he says for the type of for the type of people that like it kind of thing? That's the kind of thing those people like. We'll go with that. This cop kind of looks like uh I don't know why. It kind of reminds me of Matthew Broderick or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, he kind of looks like Matt, like an older Matthew Broderick for some reason to me. <laughs> Lawrence Tierney ain't fucking scared. All right, we got like 20 minutes left. <clears throat> One more Iron City tonight, by God. I can't tell you how happy I am that I was able to pick up Iron, Iron City beer in Cincinnati. That's one of the only beers that I like anymore. That and Guinness, that's, that's pretty much it. So now we're getting into the ritualistic sacrificing of the girls here. I will say there's really a lack of one thing about it. There's a lack of um, uh, explanation really on 
what the hell these people are doing, why they're doing it. But, but again, that's one of those things about older films that I, I prefer. Like today, I, I go watched. Um, I didn't watch. I saw somebody post something about um, uh, the Lost Boys. Um, uh, who was it? I think it was my my cousin's wife had never seen the Lost Boys, and he 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 showed it to her the other night for the first time, and she was like, "Oh, it was good." And she posted about it. She was talking about like, "Oh, but it doesn't explain this. Doesn't explain this. Doesn't explain it." And it's like. That's, I think that's the problem with a lot of modern movies now is they try too fucking hard to literally explain every single detail. Like, they don't leave any room for interpretation or imagination. It's just like, well, this happened because in their past this happened, and then it's, it's just like... Then it gets too convoluted, and it's just at the by the end of it, you don't give a fuck. But I would like a little more uh, <laughs> explanation on what, what, why these people are the way they are. I guess I, I guess basically they it's a learned thing. They inherited it from their their mother, you know, because we saw them as children. That's not a bad uh, throat slashing there. I'll, I'll give it that again. Tom Savini. I wonder if this shit, you know, you hear those conspiracy theories about uh, the Illuminati and uh, uh, adrenochrome. You see stuff like this, and then especially in, because I, I swear I'm convinced that Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, is just a movie about the Illuminati. I know Next Generation uh, really leaned into it because it was Kim Hinkle, and Kim Hinkle, you know, was one of the original creators of the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and he really leaned into it for the next generation. But I still feel like there's elements of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre that you're really just like, oh, they were, they were, I feel like they were kind of into the whole conspiracy theory about the Illuminati and whatnot for a lot of people were, um, like the grandpa, you know, you cut the finger and the grandpa, you know, sucks the finger and the blood and the grandpa starts, you know, cause before that he's just like this petrified fucking corpse but he starts getting that blood and he starts coming to life and he starts like, you know, moving his arms and stuff. And of course, you know, the, the conspiracy theory, the, you know, people think the Illuminati, they, they, they take the, the blood of what is it? It's so stupid. It's like the blood of terrified children or something like that. It's, it's something about it. Like we'll give you eternal life or something like that. And that's why they're torturing Sally, they've killed everybody else, but Sally is there to be tortured and, and just endless fear, you know, so they can kind of harvest. I don't fucking know. That's why they're trying to get, you know, the blood and the uh, <laughs> when they're trying to hit her with the hammer, you know, and the blood and the bucket thing. They're trying to, you know, uh, trying to harvest that blood for the adrenochrome. I don't know. It's. It's 1.30 in the fucking morning, guys. My brain's all over the place. And I'm about four beers in, so. Which I know, four beers, what a pussy, but, you know. I don't drink too often these days. So lay off me. Uh, Al Neary says, uh, my own guilty, not really favorite, of the rural sacrifice cult genre is Invasion of the Blood Farmers. Fun, hilarious stuff. I have never seen that. I don't even know if I've ever heard of that. Invasion of the Blood Farmer. That kind of sounds exactly like what I'm talking about with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, honestly. Let me look that up at this point. What the hell? Lawrence Tierney's on the case. He's, he's, he's going to save the day here in a second so uh what the fuck was that called invasion of the blood farmers Somewhere in upstate New York, a secretive group of farmers are harvesting human blood for a mysterious purpose. See, I swear, like that 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 conspiracy theory's been going on for years. 
I guarantee that's where they got either that or <laughs> the people that came up with the conspiracy theories took it from these movies. But uh, yeah, I've never heard of it. Uh, director Ed Adlam, never heard of, uh, never heard of him. They planted the living and harvested the dead is the tagline. Kind of sounds like uh, like Motel Hell or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, Dr. Roy Anderson, old Jim Carrey dropped dead Sunday. Oh, that, that's a that's a phrase that I don't ever going to hear. I love Jim Carrey. Yeah, I might. I don't know where, you, where, where the hell would you find that? I might have to. I come across that ever. I'll, I might check that out because it sounds like some. I love just old, low budget horror films like like this. Um, what was I watching the other day? Deathbed, the bed that eats. <laughs> Again, the things that horror fans will tolerate. Now, I mentioned earlier Lawrence Tierney's character here kind of becoming kind of the hero in the end. Um, I, I want to say I remember hearing John Russo in an interview talking about in the book. I don't know if, if you guys, I feel like Al, you said you read it um, in the book. He doesn't become the hero. He, you know, chickens out and runs away or whatever the hell. Um, not runs, not, not literally runs away, but you know, uh, whereas in this, they kind of make him somewhat of a hero. So now they're sacrificing the other girl now. And Russo also talked about, um, this girl character here, kind of the leader of the cult here, the, the sister, um, originally in the original script there was more to her character where i think she owned like an occult store or something up in new york city and it kind of fleshed her character out a little more but again seventy one thousand dollar budget you're not uh you're not gonna have all the time in the world to, to film and get everything you want in it so which i don't know if that would really add anything to the movie if we knew more about this character specifically maybe it would tell us a little more about why they're doing what they're doing but <clears throat> no another good for throat slashing there I can't imagine how bad the sequel is. <laughs> not that this is bad. I didn't, I'm not saying that. Because like I said, I kind of feel like the second half of the movie works a lot better than the first half for whatever reason. Like once they get, once, you know, like I said, once the Ampliss and uh, Besnack show up, I feel like it. it's where the movie kind of kind of picks up, but. But I had no idea there was even a sequel in the early 90s. I mean, it would have been right around that time where Santa Claus came out. So if it's anything like Santa Claus, I'm going to track it down and watch it. I don't care. Because <laughs> even Santa Claus, I was still in Larry this the other night. I was like, you know, John Russo, his, his movies are not the best. He's not the greatest director in the world. Uh, I have a lot of issues with his stuff, but for some reason I appreciate it. And even something like Santa Claus, I can find something to appreciate about it. And I think it's mostly, I love seeing Carl Hardman and Marilyn Eastman in something, you know, acting in something like that. Um, just love seeing them in general in anything. Um, so it was cool seeing them outside of Night of Living Dead, but I don't know. Like I said, you, you just got to appreciate John Russo in some way. Oh, Lawrence tyranny to the rescue. Damn.
flashlight to the head. But yeah, you got you got to respect John Russo, dude. He's kind of like ultra low budget. I mean, he is he's kind of legendary in that vein. Like he's kind of the guy that <laughs> I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's almost like he had he had in a lot of ways, John Russo had no reason or no right, I guess, no right to make to make these films. Not, I don't know, I'm sure what I'm trying to say. Not that he didn't have the right to make the films, but it's like you just gotta love his determination and tenacity to just get these movies made. It's like I'm gonna make a movie. Fuck it. We're gonna make Midnight. We're gonna make Santa Claus. We're gonna make whatever. They may not be great. And he he he'll even say it's like oh yeah they may not be the best things in the world but we 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 just got it done we got it done that was all he he cared about we got it done um and here we are what forty two years later now going back and watching <laughs> watching his movies so say what you want got to respect that. Now, that's a dumb move. I don't know why you would tell the guy to go back in the house. He could come back out with a fucking shotgun or something, but not the best, for, especially for a police officer, not the smartest move. You guys got the giggles here. So we got about five minutes left in this one. And I got to say, like, I. You know, <laughs> I do like this movie for whatever reason. I, it just has a vibe to it. Or what, what do the kids say these days? It's a vibe or something like that. I don't know. Fucking old guys. <laughs> Trying to keep up. <clears throat> but yeah, there's just something about it. I, I dig it. The music's kind of cool in parts. I love Lord's Tyranny. I just love hearing his voice. I don't know. I could listen to a uh, ooh, good. That was a good gunshot. The effects, Tom Savini. I mean, you can't beat that. You can't beat Tom Savini at this point in his career, especially for the budget that they had to work with. But yeah, I I like it. I like it. <laughs> Sue me. <laughs> It's at least better than Santa Claus. I mean, shit. Uh, Alan Houston says, I like unpolished amateur filmmaking over Hollywood bore fest crap any day. I don't care how awkward the performances are. Yeah, I mean, I am 100% with you. I was talking to <laughs> me and my dad and my brother-in-law were actually talking about that the other day. Just about, you know, AI and its effect on, you know, you know, film, you know, filmmaking and, and stuff going forward and, and into the future and and I'm I'm with you. Like I will take I'll take something like this. I'll watch something like this over a Marvel movie or something any day of the week. I I want to see something that reflects real life. I want to see like I can watch this. I can see that these are real people. These are real places, real settings. I, I don't know. There's just something. It's almost like it, it it captured a moment in time. These movies, I like, like indie film in general. They capture a moment in time. Uh, it, it's their own flavor. Uh, whereas, like you know, your big time Hollywood productions, it's just, eh, eh, I don't know. I don't get anything out of it. Yeah, it's you know a fun little roller coaster ride you can take, and it's fun to see you know. I don't know who's the big actor now. Ryan Gosling do something. I don't know. Which I like Ryan Gosling, but that's the only one that I can think of at the top of my head. But yeah, I'm I'm totally 100% with you there, Al. That's why I love George. You know, <laughs> George, I mean, too late to get deep into it, but 
But yeah, George was. George told stories about, you know, people in a real place. Pittsburgh is a real place. You know, Evan City is a real place, you know. This ending is pretty good. I mean, I dig the ending. It's just kind of a full-blown bloodbath here at the end. Ah, uh, we're about to set this dude on fire. I don't remember if this worked well or not. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> eh, eh, it's all right. Not terrible. I dig it. It worked. Here comes that music. The end. An independent international presentation. Cast here. So yeah, I guess the next one we're going to do, we're going to do the sequel next, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to see. I love watching credit sequences in, in these movies, like, you know, Bill Heinzman's movies and John Russo's movies, to see if, I, if there are any familiar names, you know, that worked with George that pop up in these moves, uh, movies. These moves. John Rice. Oh, so John Rice played one of the men at the saloon. Now I kind of want to go back to see if I can spot them. But yeah, that's it. That is uh, John Russo's Midnight from 1982. Um, yeah, I think upon second viewing, I kind of like it. You know, like I said, second half, it kind of picks up. Um, again, you know, it's flawed. It's It's messy in parts, but... I kind of, I kind of like it. There's something about it. Something about it. I, I, I got something about it. I like. <clears throat> uh, Alice has been a pleasure, Alpha. Thanks for providing the space for guys like us to talk together. I don't get to do it nearly often enough. Absolutely, man. That's why I do this channel because I don't get to do it hardly ever. Like, <laughs> I like, I love hearing and you know chatting back and forth with guys like you about this stuff because. You know, I I can't go to work on Monday and be like, hey, guys, have you seen Midnight? And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, oh, it's a 1982, you know, uh, <laughs> no budget film that was shot in Pittsburgh. I'm like, what are you talking about? So, uh, but yeah, glad you stopped in here tonight. It's been, it's been good chatting. Um, glad. Let's see, we got, got a few people still hanging on in here tonight. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate it, guys. It's uh, going on damn near two o'clock in the morning on the East Coast. So, uh, Appreciate you guys sticking through it, and uh, hope we hope you guys had as much fun as I did watching Midnight at Midnight. Uh, only thing that would have been better is if we would have caught it uh, and done it on Easter. But uh, hey, you know, uh, a week off, not too bad. Uh, like I said, uh, at some point this weekend, I'll be over on the Dead Pit talking about the uh, WrestleMania, uh, uh, which is tomorrow night and Sunday night. So I'll, you know, either Saturday or Sunday, I'm not sure, but. Um, but yeah, that's coming up this weekend. I'll be doing that. Uh, I do have a video that I'm going to drop. Uh, it's something that a lot of people have heard about, but I don't know if a lot of people have seen it. It's something I mentioned last week. Uh, if you want to go back and try to make a guess, but, uh, I'll be putting that up on the channel here soon. Um, so, uh, and then uh, next weekend, I'm not sure what I got planned. I got, I got all kinds of ideas rattling around in this empty head of mine. So, uh, uh, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see when we get there, but, uh, appreciate everybody hanging out tonight, watching, uh, watching midnight with me. Al, it's good seeing you grande. Good to have you in here, man. 1911 guitar, dude. 
Brett Aitken, congratulations winning this uh, creep show steel book from uh, Scream Factory. Like I said, I'll get that in the mail to you ASAP, sir. Appreciate everybody submitting your brackets and playing along and and voting and and love. Like I said, love seeing the comments and and hearing people, you know, give their takes on 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 all of George's films, which is one of the big reasons why I wanted to do this is just to kind of put a, a, a small spotlight on on every film even if it was you know dawn of the dead going head to head with survival of the dead it's like obviously dawn of the dead was going to win that that con you know that that vote but uh uh but again it was nice hearing people talking about survival of the dead and, and hearing some a, a lot of interesting uh takes and 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 theories and stuff that i'd never thought about for a lot of these movies so uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'll definitely be doing something again next year for March Madness. Uh, so we'll do it all over again then. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'll be back next weekend with something else. If you want to hop on over to uh, Dead Pit this weekend, if you're a wrestling fan, you want to check out and get my thoughts on WrestleMania this year, uh, I'll be over there at some point. Um, I'll also be doing Grande. Uh, Grande's having a roundtable here in a couple of weeks, April 18th. Uh, Thursday, April 18th, we're having a, a horror roundtable um, that I'll be a part of over on Grande's Graveyard. Uh, so check out Grande's channel, Grande's Graveyard. Uh, it's growing, drops a video, you know, does a live stream every week. Um, always something interesting. And I, again, a lot of the times that he, like, Grande is just like this, you know, endless bit of knowledge. Like every movie you can think of, uh, it feels like, and he's like, younger than I, he's, he's, you know, dude knows his shit. Um, so he does these streams on all kinds of different films and, and different uh, genres and stuff like that. But I, I just love hearing him talk about them. I, I, li I love hearing the kid talk about uh, talk about movies. Um, so check him out. I'll be over there April April 18th, Horror Roundtable on Grady's Graveyard. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's all I got tonight, guys. It was fun. Uh, once again, John Russo's Midnight. I give it, I, I'm giving it two thumbs up. Maybe maybe like a thumb and a half up. Um, you know, it, it's it's not perfect. It's not great, but by God, for John Russo, it's a fucking masterpiece. So salute to you, Mister Russo. Uh, but you guys have a great rest of the night, a, or I guess a I guess we're technically in Saturday. So have a great rest of the day <laughs> and a great rest of the weekend and a uh, great rest of the week. And until then, as always, stay scared. Good night, everybody. <laughs>